There are many epigenetic clocks, some of which are shown here. For example, in 2013, the Hanum clock, also in 2013, but also in 2018, two different versions of the Horvath clock. Also in 2018, Dr. Morgan Levine's PhenoAge. So this is the epigenetic estimation of the blood-based blood biomarker tool that we all use. And then there are many others, which I'll cover later in the video. Now note that all epigenetic clocks are not the same for their risk of death for all causes. So with that in mind, which epigenetic clock is best for evaluating all-cause mortality risk? That's what we'll see here, starting with the HR. This is the hazard ratio or risk of death for all causes in the middle column. And also its corresponding 95% confidence interval. And I'll get more into those details in just a minute. On the left, we've got 10 different epigenetic clocks. And note that this study included more than 2,100 people with an average age of 64 years and a 17 and a half year median follow-up. So what that means is starting from the initial baseline assessment of epigenetic age using each of these 10 clocks, who was alive and who had unfortunately died 18 years later. And then we've got the p-value. And what we can see is that six of these clocks were significantly associated with risk of death for all causes, including Horvath, Hanum, PhenoAge, Vidal Bralo, Grim Age version two, and the first iteration of Dunedin Pace, Dunedin Pace of Aging Methylation, P-O-A-M. But then there are four clocks that were not significantly associated with all-cause mortality risk, including the skin blood clock, the John clock, Lynn, and Wiedner. So in terms of addressing our question, we haven't yet done that though, even though we see that six of the 10 clocks are associated with risk of death for all causes, we haven't addressed that question of which epigenetic clock is best for, ev for evaluating all cause mortality risk. So in terms of the absolute risk, that for that we go to the HR. And there we can see that Grim Age version two for a relatively older Grim Age that's significantly associated with a 51% risk of death for all causes. Comparatively, we can see that Horvath's for having a relatively older Horvath that was significantly associated with an 11% 11, uh, 11 increased risk, 14% for Hanum, 12% for PhenoAge, 10% for Vidal Bralo, and 21% for Dunedin Pace of Aging Methylation. So just using the, using the absolute hazard ratio, we can see that Grim Age 2 was off to a good start in terms of potentially being the best epigenetic clock for evaluating risk of death for all causes but we need statistical significance. So in order to do that, we take a look at the 95% confidence interval, the data in parentheses. So if the data in parentheses for each of these clocks doesn't overlap, then we have a significant difference. So when looking at Grim Age's 95% confidence interval, it goes from 1.33 to 1.7. That's the risk for 95% of the population. Comparatively, we can see that that's different, that non-overlapping versus Horvath, Hanum, PhenoAge, and Vidal Bralo. And it's close to not overlapping with the first iteration of Dunedin Pace. As you can see, the upper bound for Dunedin Pace is 95% confidence interval goes up to 1.35, whereas the lower bound for Grim Age 2 starts at 1.33. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not significantly different. It just me means that we can't initially determine if they're different uh, based on non-overlapping 95% confidence intervals, but it's likely very close, if not st statistically significant, for Grim Age 2 being a better predictor of all-cause mortality risk relative to the first iteration of Dunedin Pace. So with that in mind, Grim Age 2 may be the best epigenetic clock, at least on this list, for evaluating all-cause mortality risk, ACM risk. So with that in mind, can we track it? And as far as I know, there's only one company that's offering Grim Age, and that's, uh, as shown here, Grim Age, that's SciFox Health. And if you're interested in measuring Grim Age 2, there's a discount link in the video's description. Now, as one prohibitive reason for not doing it is potentially cost. So this test costs $325. And for someone like me who tests up to eight or more times per year, that's a large cost for just a single test. So with that in mind, is there another way? So which biomarkers were used to derive Grim Age, and that's, we'll, that's what we'll see here. So gr note that Grim Age is an epigenetic prediction of seven proteins. And I'll, I'll just cover them here without showing all of the data yet, just to go through the seven proteins before showing more data. So they include the epigenetic estimation of leptin, PAI1, uh, adrenal medullin, ADM, 
B2M beta 2 microglobulin, GDF15, cystatin C, which if you're familiar with the channel shouldn't be a surprise or surprised to hear it, but for the others, they may be new to most people who blood test, at, at least they were to me, TIMP and TIMP1. And then there were three other variables that, go, that went into the prediction of grim age, including sex, smoking, and age. Now also note that grim age version two includes HSCRP and HbA1c. So if you're into blood testing like me, these are variables that I'm including for every test going forward. So I, I'd recommend at least including these two as they're markers of inflammation and metabolic health. Now, some of these proteins are stronger predictors of the overall uh, grim age score. So just like in phenoage, where the RDW is the strongest contributor to the overall score, some of these proteins are stronger contributors or correlated with the overall more strongly correlated with the overall grim age score and that's what we'll see here so now we've got the full data so on the top we've got grim age and then the corresponding correlations for each of the variables on the x-axis and what we can see is that there are five variables that are strongly correlated so anything greater than 0.7 is considered a strong correlation so five variables that are strongly correlated with the overall grim age score as they each have a correlation coefficient greater than 0.7 on the other hand, some of Grimage's other variables, including the epigenetic estimation of leptin, PAI1, and uh, for adrenomedullin, have relatively weaker correlations. Now, that isn't to say that they're less important, but from my perspective, if we're trying to get the biggest bang for the buck, I'd like to go after the proteins that are most strongly correlated with the overall Grimage score. So focusing on those five that have correlations of greater than 0.8. Now, two of them are commercially available, and that includes B2M, so beta-2 microglobulin, and cystatin C. As far as I know, at least in the States, the other variables, uh, the other proteins on this list, including GDF15 and TIMP1, are not commercially available, and I looked at a couple of different labs. They may be available in other places around the world. If they are, I'd recommend going for it, as their correlations are actually more strongly correlated with the overall Grimage score. So with that in mind, when considering Grimage's cost, I've included B2M and cystatin C for every test going forward, and that started with the last test for test number three. Now, in terms of cost, uh, just for these four variables, B2M, cystatin C, HSCRP, and HbA1c, that's $146 relative to the $325 cost for the DNA methylation Grimage overall test. Now, does four variables, four actual biomarkers, does that represent most of grim age score i'm not sure but this is at least a 50 percent cost reduction while getting a significant amount of data that we can potentially use to slow our epigenetic rate of aging at least assuming that we can keep b2m cystatin c hscrp and uh, hba1c relatively low if you've ever wondered what's optimal for biomarkers rather than what's just in the reference range well i have a new patreon tier dedicated just to that it currently includes the 29 biomarkers shown here, and I, I plan on growing this list. I have three more biomarkers a video that I'm working on right now, so this list will grow. It currently includes more than two hours of video content that come from 45 published references in terms of how each of these biomarkers changes during aging and or their change, their risk of death for all causes. So if you're interested in that, check it out. And if you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, then I post at least twice a day in five Patreon tiers. We've also got discount and affiliate links that you can use to test yourself that help support the channel, including ultalabtest.com, which is where I get the majority of my blood tests, the clearly filtered water filter, I use it every day, at-home metabolomics, oral microbiome composition, NED testing with Genfinity, epigenetic testing, at-home blood testing with Cyfox, Cyfox Health, which is where you can get Grimage or Grimage version two, green tea, which is what I drink every day, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch. So if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying brand, as I've got on here, and note that these shirts are not yet on YouTube. If you're interested in getting one of these shirts, just leave a comment and I'll direct you to the store, which hasn't yet linked with YouTube. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.